Hello everybody and welcome to our second exercise now where we're going to look at tests of independence. So here we're looking to see whether or not we have evidence to show that our two variables are independent of one another or perhaps they are somehow dependent or there's some sort of a relationship between those two variables. Now, once more, if you haven't watched the first uh, exercise in this module 12.2, well, you will see very, very close similarities to our exercises from module 12-1. We are comparing our observed frequency with what we would expect those frequencies to be under the assumption that the null hypothesis is true. So here we have in front of us this problem to determine whether or not political affiliation is independent of gender. So this table provides our observed frequency. So we've done some sort of a survey wondering which political party an individual supports. We have the information by Republican, Democratic, or some other political party, and we have that by gender. So these provide our observed frequencies. The very first step, well, the second step after we state our test, is to then determine what would our expected frequencies be if, in fact, the null is true. And our null here is that the two variables are independent. And so the first step, of course, is to then determine, well, what would those frequencies be? What would we expect them to be if the two variables are independent of one another? The alternative, certainly, is that the two variables, you guessed it, are not independent. Now, certainly I probably could be more specific with this rather than stating two variables. I might say political affiliation and gender are independent or political affiliation and gender are not independent, but I'm trying to keep it a little bit more brief here. So two variables is a little bit shorter. So if they were independent, that means that we would expect the proportion of men who support Republicans to be the same as the proportion of women who support Republicans. Same for Democratic, same for other. So if that's the case, then what we need to do is to determine, well, of those 220 people that we surveyed, what would that common proportion be? So the approach here sounds very, very similar to what we did when we were testing across multiple population proportions. Except that, of course, now we have multiple row categories. Here I have three rows, Republican, Democratic, and other. So we need to calculate those proportions. Once again, let's just make sure we add our terminology here that the gender is our explanatory variable, political affiliation is our response variable. So we here we're testing to see if political party is somewhat influenced by gender. Political affiliation is influenced by gender. Okay, so our expected frequencies. Well, first we need to know of the 220, 91 support the Republican. So that gives me 41.4%. So our proportion is 4.414. Here for Democratic, that's going to be very similar. That is giving me a 0 0.418. And finally, other 37 over 220 that gives me 0 0.168. So those would be those proportions that would prevail if there was no difference between men's support for the various parties and women's support for those various parties. So 
from that, we can calculate our expected values. Because once more, we are working towards this same upper tail chi-squared test, where we want to consider the difference between our observed frequency, which is what we have here in the table, the difference between it and our expected frequency. So once more, you know, you've heard me say this a few times because this methodology is similar to the other exercises that we've looked at. That expected frequency, that's the frequency that we would expect if the null is true. So if the observed frequency is very similar to the expected, which means that this difference is very small, well then when we square it, it's still going to be relatively small. One squared is just one. So those small differences will lead to a relatively small chi-squared test statistic. But if those differences are large, if that difference is 10, well, 10 squared is 100. So if those differences are large, that test statistic is going to be large. And so this is what brings us to this upper tail chi-squared test. If the differences are large, then certainly when we add those together, then that's going to give rise to a large chi-squared. If it's sufficiently large, then of course that means that those differences between what we observe and what we expect are large, and those differences can only be large if the alternative is valid. So, exactly the same methodology as we used in module 12-1 when we were looking at tests across multiple proportions. The degrees of freedom calculation here can is a little bit different because we could have within our explanatory and our response variable two, three, four, five, ten. We could have many, many, many different uh, levels of that variable. Here we keep it simple in these examples. When we're doing these examples by hand, I'll generally limit myself to two and three. So here you can see I have two levels of the explanatory variable, three levels of the response. And in the module 12-1, um, 12-2a, the previous problem, it was very similar. And again, that's just keeping these calculations simple because we're doing them by hand. Okay, let's get started. So computing those expected frequencies. So here I'm going to simply take these proportions and I apply them to those totals, to those samples. Because again, if the null is true and these variables are independent, then I would expect 0.414 times 105. I would expect 43.47 men to support the Republican Party. Similarly, for females, 43 times 0.414. No, that was wrong. 0.414 times 115. Such an easy mistake to make that one. I would expect 47.61. Once more, you've heard me say so many times how tedious these calculations are. It's so easy to make a mistake with which number you're working with or which number is your denominator. So we have to be very, very careful here. So now I'm done with the Republican. Now we take the Democratic. Again, if the variables are independent, we would expect the same proportion of men to support the Democratic Party as women supporting the Democratic. So I take that common proportion, 0.418, and now I'm multiplying these totals, 105. And that gives me 4389 and 0.418 times, now I'm on the female column, 115, 48.07. Now I'm on to the other. So I take 0.168 and I'm back here times 105. That expected value would be 1764. And for the females, it's 0.168 times 115. 
that expected value 1932. So if the null is true and if they're independent, those are the values that we would expect. Those are the frequencies that we would expect to see. Now we go through the same exercise. We compare, we calculate those differences between observed and expected. We square those differences. We divide those differences by that expected value. And then somewhere down here, we add all those up. And that gives us our chi-squared test statistic. Okay, so I will start. So here I'm going to have 48. Oops, I'm right on the edge of my screen. It won't let me right there. 48 minus 43.47. So I'm starting on Republican and we'll go across each row. So 48 minus 43.47. So that gives me 4.53. I'm going to square that. And I'm going to divide that by the expected value. And that gives me 0.472. And then we carry on. So now I'll go through the, the female. This is going to be 43 minus 47.61 minus 4.61. I square this. And I divide by that expected value. 0 0.446 and so now I'm into the democratic row so this first one is 36 minus 4389 36 minus 4389 so negative 789 I square this 6225 divide by the expected value 1.418. Now we move to the females. 56 minus 48.07. 793. 62.88. Squared. Whoops. Not squared. Divided by. 48.07 and there's 1.308 now I'm into the next and last row for other 21 minus 1764 squared divided by 1764 and finally, the last one, 16 minus 1932. Square this. Divide by 1932. And there we go, finally. Now I'm gonna add that column. Here I'm just gonna add up. Of course, it doesn't matter which way we go plus 0.64 plus 1.308 plus 1.418 plus 0.446 plus 0.472 and there I have my test statistic 4.85 oh, okay we got that finally done so we have our test statistic now the rest of this problem is the same as every other problem. We need to know our degrees of freedom. Well, our degrees of freedom for these types of problems is the number of categories in the row minus one times the number in the columns minus one. So here I have in the response variable in the rows, I have three and in the columns, I have two. So this is going to give me two degrees of freedom.
for this particular test. And of course, you can see how the degrees of freedom can change. All of the examples that we've done have had two degrees of freedom, but I don't want you to be led to believe that it's always going to be two degrees of freedom. If we had more row values or more column categories, then certainly it can be something other than just two. We keep it to two. We keep those observed frequencies relatively small in number only to keep these calculations to a minimum. If we added more, it would just get more and more time consuming. But the nature of the calculations would be entirely identical. Just more of them. Okay, so here we're doing this test at the 5% level of significance. So I'm going to take that 4.85, come down to our chi-square, two degrees of freedom, 4.85, we're between here and here. And if we take a look at what this is going to look like, here I have some chi-square distribution. I have alpha, is 0.05, that critical value is 5.991, that gives me an area here of 0.05, our test statistic 0.485 is somewhere in here, 4.85, and so that p-value well, it must be something greater than 0 0.05. Again, so much of this, after all of the tests that we have done, much of this should just be second nature for you at this point. Applying that critical value rejection rule, applying the p-value rejection rule. Here I can see clearly that we do not reject that null hypothesis. Our p-value Whoops. Our p-value is less than 0.1, but greater than 0.05. If we're doing this at the 5% level of significance, then knowing that my p-value is greater than 0.05, we do not reject. We therefore have insufficient evidence to show that there is any lack of independence. In other words, our data supports the null hypothesis. We have reason to believe that our two variables, gender and political affiliation, are in fact independent. Okay, that's it for this problem. I hope that that was helpful. We've got one more exercise to get through in this section, module 12 dash Two, then we move on to tests on goodness of fit. And again, you'll see so many similarities there as well. Okay, thank you for watching, everybody. Bye-bye.